I would like to begin to it by acknowledging the um, uh, of traditional owners of the land on which I'm meeting tonight, which is in Melbourne. So that's the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders. And also to acknowledge that today, of course, we had the funeral of Archie Roach here in Melbourne. So that's a, been a big day, big occasion. Um, this, for those who are new to this particular um, event, um, this series of Zoom seminars is to acknowledge or recognize uh, Labor History's 60th year, 60th anniversary. And uh, we're basically showcasing work that Labor History is publishing. And so tonight um, we're very pleased to have um, two papers by people whose articles are appearing in the, no, the very next issue, the November issue this year. Uh, we made a conscious decision to publish people who hadn't published before, um, who are new researchers in the field of labour history. And it happens that they're also both working in uh, women's labour history. So that was nice and fortuitous. So um, Hannah Viney ha is a PhD student at Monash. Um, where she's working on um, Australian women's anti-nuclear activism um, from oh, 1945 to 1970s, which is quite a long period of time. But she has done some past research on um, women, work, I think working, were you, um, Hannah, on a display of women at the old Melbourne jail site. So, She's kind of was working in social history and now she's moved into a kind of political history of women during the Cold War period. So she will go first and then we will hear from Freya Willis, who's an MA student at Oxford, where she has a Rhodes Scholarship, I believe, um, and is doing research now for her MA on the growth of low paid feminized caring work. Um, in Britain in the 1980s. So um, as we might have guessed, she did her ANU uh, with Frank, I gather, at, um, sorry, her BA at uh, ANU and uh, her honours degree. And this work that she's going to talk about tonight is, as I think, came from her honours thesis and has developed from that. So um, we will have quest time for questions at the end, but I think we'll take each speaker, uh, Hannah first, then Freya, and then we'll take questions uh, uh, at the end of both those talks. So um, thank you, Hannah. Hand over to you now, and you can take it from there. Thank you very much. Just share my screen. Can you see that? Indeed. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so, as Diane said, this is not sort of my main area of history. Um, generally, I do Cold War women's political history, and this is sort of a bit of a side project of mine that I've been working on for a few years. Um, so, I'm going to start, I want to talk about this photo here, which is really where I went into this uh, research. So, when I was a baby historian doing my honours uh, a few years ago, we were doing an assignment that was trying to get us comfortable with archives. So, we just read Derrida's Archive Fever and there was a lot of jokes going around that actually Archive Fever was psychosis brought about by inhaling mould spores from mildewy <laughs> books in the archive. But apart from those jokes, there was also a sense that maybe archival fever had kind of passed us by. So many of us were really doing... Um, work in digital archives. And so very few of us had reason or the opportunity to go to a physical archive. So I was myself spending all my years scrolling through Trove's sadly no longer um, accessible Women's Weekly, Australian Women's Weekly website. And I hadn't had a chance to go to an archive for anything. And so I think most of us were a little bit skeptical that we would find anything in an archive that could even sort of spark something approaching a fever. Um, so for this assignment, which was for the National Trust of Australia, uh, the Victorian branch, they'd given us a few possible projects to choose from, uh, hoping that they would update some of their displays at different properties. So I elected to do a project on the women who were working at the old Melbourne jail uh, when it was active. 
which was designed to kind of bring in a different perspective to the tourist site, which was very much focused on um, the people that had been, you know, incarcerated in the jail. So my first archival trip for this project was to the old Melbourne jail reading room, which was essentially the storage room at the old Melbourne jail with various files, past exhibition notes, commissioned histories, um, and an internal library for the National Trust staff. And I think, as is true for probably most of us um, and any of us who do any sort of research, there was a mass of papers that wasn't necessarily the most logically organised. So I found a bit of bits and pieces of past research done on this area, some scans of documents held at uh, PROV or the State Library, and it was looking like it was maybe a mildly helpful first visit, um, dipping my toe in, but I was probably going to go elsewhere to do more of the research. And then I found in a folder labelled Watch House Matrons, I found a photocopy of this photograph. It was a bit blurry, um, it wasn't super clear, and it didn't have a much detail about it. On the back of the photocopy, it suggested that the women were matrons, former matrons at the Watch House, uh, Carolyn Friley, Nora Fitzgerald and Eleanor Wernett, and that the picture was taken maybe sometime between 1915 and 1924. So there was extensive notes attached to it on tracing who was in the photo uh, with letters to descendants from the different women that they thought might be in it, asking, does anyone look vaguely familiar? Do you see a nose that looks like your nose? Um, and there was no real conclusive answer. There was people writing back going, maybe it might be my great, great, great aunt. Can't really say. So, and even more frustratingly, there was no source of where this photo had come from, where the, the jail had found it originally. But it was so striking, I wanted to know more. So this is how I was drawn into researching the women who worked for Victoria's penal system in the 19th and the early 20th centuries. And the research that would become the basis for my article that's coming out in November. So researching this period was very much outside my comfort zone, but the women in this photograph grabbed me and they wouldn't let me go until I told some of their story. There's been very little research done in the employment of women in the penal system of Victoria or elsewhere around the world. So despite a flourishing histor historiography of criminology in Australia, and particularly a strong emphasis on the intersections of gender and crime, most of this work is focused on those accused, charged or convicted with a crime. There are very few general histories of the penal system in Victoria. And again, these do not really reference the female employees of the system. They're very broad, large strokes histories. The most relevant histories of women working in a similar system actually come from authors like Leanne Monk, who have considered the employment of women within Victoria's asylum system. So the work was very similar um, and there is evidence that some women worked in both systems. Outside of Victoria, there are a few studies which consider women's employment in prisons and jails, particularly in Britain and America, but these are generally very focused on a particular period or they sort of do a broad strokes cover of it. Yeah. I argue that researching women's paid employment within Victoria's penal system reveals how changing social ideas at the turn of the century influenced a gendering of women's labour in prisons and watch houses. I argue that by examining this more closely, uh, by exploring how women's paid employment in prisons changed from the early days of the colony to the early 20th century, we can better appreciate more broadly how ideas of gender influence women's employment opportunities and experiences in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So for the next part of the paper, I'm going to briefly trace the history of women's employment in the penal system before I discuss what I think we can learn from this sort of analysis. So in the 1840s, with Melbourne's population rapidly swelling from a few hundred in 1836 to nearly 24,000 people in 1842, the growing city required a new purpose-built facility for mass incarceration. So the Melbourne jail at the top of Russell Street was opened in 1845 to house the increasing number of individuals convicted for various crimes. A second cell block was opened in 1857 after the gold rush brought even more people and more crime into the city. But it wasn't until 1865 that there was a female only wing opened to house female prisoners separately from the men. In 1894, Pentridge Female Prison was opened and most of the women that had been incarcerated at Melbourne Jail were transferred there to serve out their sentences. Adjacent to the jail was the City Watch House, which was opened in 1909 to provide a more streamlined process from arrest to imprisonment. So the latter half of the 19th century saw a large increase in the number of women arrested and imprisoned in Melbourne. 
as I said, the gold rush had radically increased the city's population and had brought a lot more women to the colony. And so fears of subsequent social immorality resulted in colonial authorities pushing for a strong stance on criminality and with a disproportionately high number of women consequently arrested for sex work or other quote, indecent behaviours. This was also a period of intense prison reform in Victoria, um, as well as around Australia and in Europe and America. Key aspects of this reformist thinking were the need to separate male and female inmates and an emphasis on the need to reform prisoners rather than simply punish. This was particularly important, reformists argued, for incarcerated women. Most Victorians saw women as an inherently more moral sex, and so prison reformers argued that female criminals simply needed to be guided back to their own innate sense of morality. The best way to do this, they argued, would be through upstanding women going in to model appropriate behaviours. So when Melbourne Jail first opened, the wife of jail overseer George Wintle, Mary Wintle, was employed as a matron. As the number of women imprisoned in the jail more than doubled in the next 15 years, from 21 in 1852 to 50 in 1861, Wintle was joined by two or three other women at various times who were generally also the wives of male prison officers. So sadly, survivory records on the work these women performed at Melbourne Jail is very limited. Uh, Prov did hold a collection of documents from Pentridge Female Prison, which would have been amazing, uh, but these were badly damaged in a fire and so are inaccessible. So surviving circulars that would have been issued to prison officers, uh, the best place that we can find some detail about the work, but they're generally focused either on male wardens or sort of generally wardens, but they do provide some insight into the duties women performed. So it appears that the primary role of female prison officers in the early days of the jail was supervision of female inmates. The women imprisoned at Melbourne and elsewhere were in an extremely vulnerable position. With very little oversight, it would have been very easy for male officers to take advantage. Jail regulations meant that inmates, both male and female, were often required to undress in the presence of officers. Uh, they would be subjected to treatments like a hot or vapour bath when they were ill. Um, they might be required to strip for searching, especially when they were leaving the prison or coming into the prison. And prisoners condemned to death were to undress before bed so they could be searched. Moreover, prisoners could actually be assigned as servants to warders and their families, and so could be taken into warders' quarters to perform this work. And so although incarcerated women were officially barred from entering warders' quarters, quote, in the absence of the grown-up female member of the family, end quote, enforcement of this would have been near impossible, and it would have been very easy for a male officer to physically or sexually assault a female prisoner in the privacy of his own room. So prison reformers hoped that employing more women would prevent exploitation, and so the duties of female warders evolved to encompass a more protective role. Several of these circulars on such situations explicitly noted the need for a female presence. While very few circulars in this period mentioned mm -hmm. female officers, those that did explicitly referred to their role supervising female inmates in vulnerable situations. So there was one long circular which listed the duties of senior jail officers, which made a point of mentioning that male warders were not to attend a female prisoner or even, quote, open the door, end quote, to the room unless, quote, accompanied by a female officer. The largely supervisory nature of the work, however, began to change at the turn of the century, at least partly in response to the circulation of new ideas on women's roles and responsibilities in a more modern society. So the late 19th century saw the rise of the woman movement and the growing influence of maternal feminists. Drawing on the idea mentioned above that women were the naturally moral sex, feminists argued that women were in need, were needed in formal political structures to provide a more moral voice that was lacking when men were alone. So those ideas fit very neatly with the idea that prisons should be places of reform and prison reformers, many of whom sort of were also maternal feminists, argued that women should be employed in the penal system to provide that innate morality and help rehabilitate the quote fallen women. In the early 20th century, these beliefs underpinned a sustained campaign to employ women as matrons at the proposed new city watch house in Melbourne. A key champion of this cause was the National Council of Women of Victoria, particularly member Evelyn Goh. On the night of the 26th of, January, of July, sorry, 1902, Goh and her fellow reformer, Maria Kirk, visited the old Russell Street lockup, which would be replaced years later by the City Watch House. 
Go and Kirk visited the lockup as part of an investigation for the newly formed NCWV into the conditions of women in city and suburban lockups. The council was concerned that Victoria's lockups were unable to provide the care and facilities arrested women were entitled to when they were awaiting trial or release. Go returned repeatedly to various lockups over the next six months before producing a report on her findings. In this report, she recommended several reforms that the council deemed necessary for the best possible outcomes of arrested women. These suggestions included that the Victorian government should set aside revenue to be, quote, applied towards maintaining a staff of capable women to look after women. On the grounds that even the lowliest human being calling herself woman has the right to the services of her own sex, end quote. Most importantly, the report argued, quote, only contact with the decent, the sober and the orderly of their own sex would be able to awaken shame and revive self-respect, end quote, for such fallen women. So the Watch House wouldn't be opened for another seven years, but the campaign for matrons had paid off. So from its opening in 1909, the Melbourne City Watch House was staffed by both men and women, which was a practice that lasted until it ceased operations in 1994. At the time it opened, there were three matrons employed there, Jean White, Nora Fitzgerald and Eleanor Wernett. White had previously worked as a nurse and had some experience with the criminal justice system through her husband and two brothers, who were all police constables. And she took this up position as head matron at the watch house, shortly after the death of her husband in order to support herself as a widow. White would later resign in early 1911 due to conflict with other watch house staff, possibly Fitzgerald and Wernett, um, maybe over pay conditions. And White was replaced by Carolyn Friley, who had been working at Maryborough Station in the refreshments kiosk. So the matrons at the watch house performed similar work to the women working at the jail, particularly the management of female inmates. They were certainly thrown into the job when, on the first day of the watch house's operations, incoming inmate Beatrice Phillips caused, quote, a disturbance that looked like a heap of clothes in a whirlwind and made a noise like a thunderstorm, end quote. Female matrons at the watch house were responsible for searching the women before they were taken to the cells. In the words of the member for Carlton at the time, R. H. Solly, a few years later when he was arguing for increased pay for these women, it was rough work. Quote, I am told that some of these women are in a most disgraceful condition when arrested. Their clothing is in a dreadful state and some of them are suffering from a vile disease. <coughs> the female warders and searchers have to strip the women and wash them. They are liable to contagion. Frequently, a woman of this class in a drunken condition acts in a most violent manner and tears the clothes off the woman searcher, end quote. So though Solly would have likely exaggerated the conditions to make his point, the matrons did regularly find weapons and other dangerous items on the women they searched. Yet reflective of the reformist ideas that I covered above, the matrons were also expected to help rehabilitate their female charges. So watch house matrons believed that they were responsible not only for protecting their charges from threats to their person, but also working to redeem the women in their care. So vital for this task and what recommended a matron above male officers was, quote, her intuition, sympathy and kindly. <coughs> According to a profile on prison matrons in the Herald, quote, the woman prisoner detects the kindly note of sympathy and feels that she has found a friend, end quote. They offered their charges kindly words of encouragement when needed and endeavoured to temper discipline with kindness. This is clear in their duties. Matrons on morning duty who are responsible for getting the accused to court for trial strove to give the women a certain faith in themselves by providing a clean jacket and a decent hat. Unlike male officers, the matrons argued that they could, quote, sink the individuality of the official into that of the woman, end quote and therefore not only perform their official duties, but also attempt to use their kindly nature to affect positive changes in their charges. White, when interviewed in the Herald in 1911, strongly asserted her own and the other women's responsibility for instilling respectability for dissolute characters. White declared that matrons were there to try and help if they can, and she tried to do something for her women. White lamented that there was no reformatory institution for women go to because she felt quote if only I'd had the women for longer I would be able to save them from their selves or give them a fresh start end quote. So it's clear from how these women described their work that there was a gendered element in how their labour was conceived both by themselves and by wider society 
Research on female warders employed at Victorian England prisons suggests that the expectations placed upon female prison officers was indeed more exacting and explicit in the expectation to reform. Based on surviving evidence from the penal system in Victoria, it's difficult to establish this conclusively that the same gender difference is applied here. However, surviving accounts from male prison officers and the description of their work in penal reform documents suggest male officers were not expected to model appropriate behaviour for male inmates the same way. So therefore, in the characterisation of the matron's employment as rehabilitators as well as incarcerators, the impact of the ideals stemming from the woman movement and from activism from women like Evelyn Goh and the National Council of Women is very clear. The language of reform can be recognised as a lens through which women's labour at the Watch House was understood. Changing social expectations and understandings of women, both the criminal and the decent, added additional labour to their work. Changing the nature of their employment by making them not only physical wardens, but moral custodians as well. Yet, at the same time, this also provided women with greater employment opportunities. So perhaps the most satisfying development of this research, however, is that I can put names to the women in the photograph that began it all. So after hours of trawling through the State Library of Victoria records and sending friends to do the same and using every possible keyword combination I could find, I found the original photo. There was no names attached, but thanks to the campaigns for prison reform and the employment of matrons at the Watch House, there was significant public interest in the women eventually employed there. And so these women were profiled in the Herald and these profiles included photos of each of them. And so in this photo, which would have been taken in 1909 or 1910, rather than later as it, as it said, we have Eleanor Wernett, Jean White and Nora Fitzgerald. Thank you. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you, Hannah. Um, that was going to be my question. <laughs> <laughs> about how you track down the photo, but that's that's terrific. So thank you so much. And thank you for keeping so well to time. That's great. Um, so now um, we'll remove yours from the screen. Thank you. And hand over to Freya, who's joining us from Oxford. So um, early in the morning there, or maybe not so early, but anyway, in the morning there. So yeah, a very civilised hour from this morning. <laughs> thank you, Freya. I'm also going to share my screen if I may. Can everybody say that? Yes, that's good. Um, awesome. So yeah, um, lovely to be here and thank you for having me. Um, as the slide suggests, uh, my research was considering um, gender hierarchies in the Australasian Meat Industry Employees Union, um, also known as the AMIEU. Um, and I just thought I might um, begin today with a few comments on my kind of approach in, uh, to, to this topic. And I think um, in the tradition of where a lot of labour history, I think, is going um, now and, and into the future, um, I really drew together kind of a number of different approaches, including traditional labour history, um, but also kind of cultural and feminist history, um, and also some sort of works of sociology and uh, gender theorists. So my kind of aim in undertaking this project um, was to understand how the sexual division of labour um, and uh, occupational sex typing um, operated within the meat industry um, and the AMIEU itself. Uh, and central to what I was trying to understand is um, how do ideas about what constitutes masculinity and femininity and the codes of what was socially acceptable um, for men and women in terms of their behaviour, their demeanour, their work, their gender presentation, um, how were these not purely cultural concepts, but also became part of uh, a social and economic structure of the labour market, and ultimately then also became ingrained on a personal level? Um, because I think it's often by kind of observing the everyday and the mundane of individuals' lives that we get to see how certain ideas become naturalised and become hegemonic. And indeed, this was really one of the key insights um, of Judith Butler, the gender theorist, 
whose theory of gender performativity um, I draw on extensively uh, in my analysis, because she emphasized that the cultural meaning of gender um, is produced by mundane but repeated performances of gender identity. And what I found really useful about this theory um, was that it both helps to explain how fundamentally hierarchical um, and exclusionary ideas about women's proper place in society um, could become inscribed on the self and on the body and therefore be made to appear as natural. Um, but I think also within this analysis, there leaves scope um, for agency and in you know, the failure to repeat a performance or to parody a performance, um, to subvert these ideas. And therefore, I think that also leaves scope um, for leadership, which I'll get to uh, in the second half of this um, presentation. Uh, just to set the scene, I guess, at the beginning about what was going on in the meat industry um, in the 1970s. So uh, women had begun entering the meat industry since the 1950s. Um, and by the 1970s, they made up about 90% of poultry workers or white meat workers, um, and around 15 to 20% of um, red meat workers. Most women were employed in the kind of less skilled areas like packing, pre-packing, canning, um, tennis strings. And um, the heavy and sort of more skilled work of slaughtering and slicing red meat continued to be male dominated. Um, as a union, the AMIAU was um, a blue collar union. It was uh, leftist with a notable communist influence. It was militant, um, but it was also fairly connected to social movements, um, including the women's liberation movement. And obviously the 1970s was a time of changing gender roles in many parts of society. Um, and that included female meat workers and unionists um, who sought to redefine what women's place within the industry and the union was. So to begin just by considering um, the kind of ideal types of masculinity and femininity that were promoted within the meat industry itself. Um, the blood and guts nature of meat processing, that is like the tough, and dangerous and dirty conditions in which the work was performed and the heavy and violent nature of the work itself um, was seen to breed a male meat worker that uh, had a really kind of embodied masculinity. It valued qualities of being physically strong um, and militant. In one of the oral history interviews that I conducted with Yvonne Smith, who was a claims officer um, at the AMIEU in Victoria, when I asked her about the work of male meat workers, she recounted, and I quote, you've got a great big carcass, enormous big thing, and you've got to slice it up, lugging those great lumps of stuff. They come around and they kill them with a bolt, an electric bolt, and then they chuck them over the side of the table and they hang down upside down, dribbling and tongue hanging out. They're dead, but it was a pretty brutal sort of thing. And I think this quote is uh, really striking in the way it captures the brutality of the work, but also in the way it exemplifies what Blake Ashworth and Glenn Craner call dirty work stigma. Yvonne Smith, even all these years later, is still kind of viscerally repulsed um, by the dirty and harsh working conditions that she saw on the shop floor. And the salience of this stigma, um, Ashworth and Craner argue, drives workplace cultures to recast um, their dirty and stigmatized work in more positive terms, and in fact, to reward the very things that other people stigmatize. And certainly within the meat industry, there is an occupational reward structure um, that prizes and values physical and violent labor. So the roles like boning and slaughtering, um, which you know, are the heaviest and the most violent, are also the highest paid um, and the most fiercely guarded by male meat workers. And this high premium placed on physical labor is in many ways a reversal um, of the kinds of value, uh, yeah, workplace value structures that exist in other industries, um, which is a point that Bob Hawke actually made in the Equal Pay case in 1969. Um, and this kind of serves a couple of purposes. Uh, on one hand, you know, male meat workers uh, might be less economically powerful than the white collar men that employ them, but they can kind of assure themselves that they're more physically masculine and dominant. But at the same time, it also works to preserve the privileged status of men in the industry um, over women. Until 1975, um, women were prohibited from lift lifting over 35 pounds. Uh, and this continued to be a justification 
um, for denying them equal pay right up until 1975. Uh, and on several occasions, um, male meat workers and the AMIU worked to exclude women from roles such as slaughtering and boning. Um, there were strikes in 1973 and 1975 when men walked off the job because women were employed um, as slaughterers and boners. Uh, and even when the AMIU ordered them back to work, um, they basically adopted a policy that men should be given preference for these roles uh, over women whenever a new position came up. And um, the kind of constant refrain that the AMIU used throughout these battles was that certain types of work were unsuitable for women. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and this kind of works, this notion of suitability, um, I think works to preserve the masculine character of the work itself. Because of course, the corollary of something being considered um, unsuitable for women is that the performance of that labor becomes a signifier of masculinity. Uh, the, the kind of logic of it is that we do this work because we are men and women don't do it because, it, because it's masculine. And I guess in contrast then to the physicality of men's work, um, women's work was often described as light work. Um, as women gradually won the right to work in the meat industry, they remained mostly concentrated in areas such as tennis strings, sausage casing, trimming, packing, canning, um, and white meat boning. Tasks which, according to the Arbitration Commission in 1975, required the manual dexterity and repetitive work for which women were eminently suitable. And the discursive construction of women's work as light work was legitimated by discourses about the physical physical capabilities of women's bodies. A pamphlet produced by the AMIU Queensland um, explained that the prohibition on women lifting over 35 pounds was based on, I quote, the fundamental need to protect women workers as mothers and mothers-to-be from injuries which were bound to jeopardize women's opportunities to bear children. Uh, and so Ruth Milk Milkman, the American sociologist, argues that sex typing centers on the, re on the construction of analogies between women's paid jobs and domestic labor. And her point is not that the work is exactly the same, but rather that the continual emphasis on the interconnectedness of family and working life ensures that women identified and were perceived primarily as mothers and wives rather than workers. And we can see in this, the, for example, in this AMIAU pamphlet, that it elevated um, women's motherhood functions above all others, um, including their paid job. The pamphlet also um, presupposes that there's something, uh, you know, by virtue of women's reproductive functions that is essential and common um, and fixed to all women's bodies that makes them unsuitable for certain types of work, obviously erasing the true diversity that exists within women's bodies. And thereby um, the restriction on women's work and the lower rate of pay that went along with that is made to appear as a kind of natural consequence of biological difference rather than as a socially constructed or economic structure. Um, and the reality that's kind of exposed here that sex typing was often based on fictitious, fictitious or arbitrary assumptions about the nature of work and the people performing it was gradually exposed over the course of the 1970s um, as a fiction, as women began to enter new areas of work. So some jobs, such as trimming and packing, shifted over the course of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s from being considered more suitable to men to more suitable for women without any reconfiguration of the work itself. The AMIU president admitted in 1969 that where once it had been considered socially unacceptable for women to, to do any work involving knives, by 1969, it was commonplace. And although the feminization of work was often accompanied by its, re, by its rebranding as light work, the reality was that there was very little that was light about it at all, but rather all work called for constant lifting and pushing and demanded a lot of physical strength. Um, indeed, some women in the 1970s did actually succeed in taking up the previously, the heavy roles of slaughtering and boning. And so there was a growing disjunction between the discursive construction of women's work as light work and the reality of the labor that was being performed on the shop floor. And it is in these repeated transgressive performances that we begin to see gradual shifts um, and expansion of the notion of, of ideas about the tasks that women could and should perform. Um, 
were <laughs> eventually opened up to women. Nevertheless, despite some of the obvious progress that was made, it also remains true to this day that slaughtering and boning um, are highly male dominated, which suggests that the designation of work as either women's work or men's work, especially once linked to discourses about the physical capabilities of women's bodies, um, became naturalized in ways that were quite difficult to change. Uh, I think we can also see sex typing at play within the work of the AMIEU. Um, many of the AMIU's values and traditions were established at a time when there were very few men, uh, women in the union. And they cultivated a culture of larrikinism um, that was typical of many blue collar unions in Australia at the time. And it was bound together in mateship and expressed through glorification of drinking, fighting, physicality, and at times sexist humor. Uh, to kind of take an example, um, the union held uh, an annual picnic for all its members um, in Victoria. And the main kind of organized events at, th at this picnic were running races in which men competed to display their physical prowess. Uh, the events were always kind of written up in the Union Journal afterwards. And men were given funny nicknames and anecdotes and jokes were told about their participation. Women were usually only included as the butt of men's lewd jokes. Uh, for example, a male meat worker allegedly declared the winner of the single ladies race by saying, the young lass in blue won by a nipple as they breasted the tape. So we can kind of see the sexualization and objectification of women's bodies here. Um, and in an illustration of the picnic in the journal, which you can uh, see up here on the screen, um, a reproduction of, we can see a man holding an esky of beer uh, who's, you know, physically uh, extremely large, kind of towering over his uh, impossibly petite wife who's holding the basket of food um, while the children run ahead of her. And it's interesting to note here that the woman is depicted not as a meat worker herself, but rather as the consort of a male meat worker. And the joyous and smiling depiction, this kind of like idyllic family situation, I think serves to try and reassure us that the division of labor that is um, clearly evident here is natural and positive for all involved. The ideal form of masculinity that was celebrated by the union as is kind of perfectly exemplified in this image was a well-built man who drank heavily, usually beer, was physically and sexually dominant over women and was mates with and loyal to his co-workers. That camaraderie that was the basis of this mateship though was dependent on a high degree of sameness on all being men, on doing the same activities, drinking the same drinks, and sharing a sense of humor. It was very difficult for women to be celebrated or indeed to infiltrate this culture because their bodies were seen in such starkly different sexualized terms. They were relegated to the roles they had always occupied as that of you know, the housewife, um, yeah, or, or the kind of sexual object. And the bonds that were cultivated through these official union activities were not only important to workers' social lives, they also provided the basis for solidarity and collective action. And so there were already many practical barriers to women's participation in industrial action. To take one prominent example, um, in the 1970s, the AMIEU organized a number of strikes and pickets to protect live animal to test live animal exports. Um, the pickets were usually staffed by men. They were overnight, people had to sleep rough. Um, and there were often violent confrontations with police or suppliers and trucks. And this was difficult for women to, with caring responsibilities to participate in, but it also conflicted with this uh, caring and submissive role which they had been conditioned to assume. Um, at the same time, sex segregation, sex segregation actually affected how uh, members viewed women's industrial concerns. So Alice Hughes, a delegate at the Borthwick's Morton Meatworks, recalled that while women were expected to strike alongside men uh, whenever they called a stoppage, even if it didn't affect the women directly or was in a different department, when women went on strike over equal pay, men were initially reluctant to strike as well. They, they said that it was a women's issue rather than a union issue. In other words, the traditional bonds of class and union solidarity were not initially extended to women workers who were not viewed as equal counterparts whose concerns were seen as rather peripheral. Over the course of the 1970s though, again, through these kind of repeated transgressive gender performances, these ideas began to change. 
In Queensland, a particularly militant constituency, uh, women began to turn out to strikes in larger numbers um, and skilled delegates like Hughes were able to kind of leverage women's participation in men's causes to demand that they do the same and support women's campaigns. Um, enabled by a kind of highly devolved uh, structure of the AMIU, where strikes were often organised and called by the rank and file at the local level, um, this lent itself to a kind of highly reciprocal and personalised brand of solidarity. Um, and so in the end, Hughes recalls that it became automatic for men to strike alongside women for the cause of equal pay. Um, and she reflected that they actually changed the ideas of men about what constituted a union issue and what constituted a women's issue. Nevertheless, um, not everybody was supportive of militant women. Um, journalists still often kind of refer to the cliche of meat men to describe strikers, suggesting that at least in the public eye, um, the image of meat workers was still unequivocally male. Um, but also women often faced uh, retribution from employers for their participation in industrial action. So Hughes um, had the retirement age of, compulsory retirement age of 60 enforced upon her um, when other militant men and women, uh, other militant men didn't necessarily have that. And she believed that was because um, she was becoming a real force in the union and the employer was trying to um, kind of stop her in her tracks. Um, and Yvonne Smith also recalled an incident in Victoria where a female employee was sacked after participating in industrial action um, uh, when men, her male counterparts weren't because the employer didn't want her spreading her foul messages um, amongst the female workers. And, you know, while it's definitely not a new phenomenon for um, employers to take retribution against militant workers, um, the gendered manner in which these punishments were meted out suggests that it was more serious for women to participate um, in industrial action, partly perhaps because it threatened the kind of gender ideals of women as caring and domestic and submissive. Um, but partly also because um, an increasingly militant women's workforce um, posed a kind of increased threat to employers economically. So I think what's kind of clear from this is that the 1970s was a time of instability for the gender order. Um, and in order to kind of better understand the conditions under which um, women's transgressive performances could lead to could, could kind of challenge their subordinate gender role within the AMIEU. Um, in the article, I looked at three examples of female leaders um, and how they went about this. But uh, for the sake of time today, I'm just going to look at um, one of them. Uh, so this is um, Alice Hughes. And she was a, uh, as I said, a delegate at the Borthwick Morton Meatworks in um, Queensland. Uh, she had been a communist or was a lifelong um, communist and so uh, had had some experience in uh, organising before and certainly organising on um, women's issues. And um, I think uh, in one incident, which uh, I think kind of ex exemplifies her leadership strategy, um, sorry, I'm just getting up there. The, um, so uh, she worked, she actually, as, as a part of her communist activism, took a job on the shop floor um, of the meat industry uh, with the express purpose of organising the women. And part of her experiences there was that she recalls kind of daily sexual harassment um, faced by women workers. And she would often, as a kind of senior woman and, and a militant, kind of intervene in these situations. And so she recalled an incident um, and it's hard to say exactly, you know, how typical this was, probably not very likely. In fact, probably the, the reason why she chose to recall is because it was, um, uh, you know, entertaining and, and outlandish. But I think it's still instructive um, about how gender hierarchies could be challenged in certain situations. So Hughes recalls confronting a man who had sexually harassed a female co-worker. Um, and in response, she says, I quote, he abused me something shocking and he's a huge and big man. So I said, this afternoon when we knock off at a quarter to four, I'll be down at the gates and I will take you on, you big bastard. I had long underpants on and they were like long boxing trunks and the old boxes that the, the, the old boxers used to wear. And I said, I know a bit about fighting. And I said, I'll give him a kick every now and then. And I said, I bet I'll bring him down within five minutes. And then when I got down to the gate in the afternoon, it was full of meat workers and the man wasn't anywhere to be seen. 
Um, and so I think we see here kind of an extremely kind of humorous, uh, but sort of play on, on gender roles uh, and gender performance. Judith Butler has written of cross-gender performances that they subvert and mock the notion of a true or natural gender identity and correspondingly the power structures that rest upon it because they reveal those aspects of gendered experience which are falsely nat naturalized and the imitative structure of gender itself as well as its contingency on certain disciplinary practices and corporal signs. And so by adopting the dress and persona of a male boxer, of imitating perhaps a Rocky-like figure, um, Hughes was impersonating um, a figure who perhaps epitomizes male meatworker masculinity. She's pretending to be kind of, or playing at being physically strong and virile and tough and prone to fighting. And Hughes kind of deliberately plays up the theatrics of this act, of her action. She's playing to the performer, she's playing to, to the, um, to the meat workers who are her co-workers. Uh, and she's undoubtedly cutting a kind of humorous figure because ultimately she's in sort of oversized underpants and she's got this very blustering uh, sort of trash talk. And her cross-gender performance thereby caricatured and mocked the equation of meat, uh, male meat worker persona with dominance and power, um, exposing it to be little more than a kind of fantastical dress up, um, a mockery which Hughes' audience also buys into um, by laughing along with them. And so Hughes' ability to move easily between feminine and masculine gender presentations draws attention to the fragility of the sexual differences that were the basis of men's superiority over women. And, but I think it's important to note that at the same time as she's parroting gender hierarchies, she is also citational. Um, even if comedic, the scripts and symbols that are available to Hughes to signify power were only intelligible because of the pre-existing links between the ideal of meat worker masculinity um, and strength and dominance. It's by adopting this kind of hegemonic masculine posture that at least in her retelling, Hughes was able to pressure her male colleagues um, to change their behavior. And this did little to kind of alter the association of femininity uh, with weakness and submissiveness. Indeed, the female worker who was the victim of the sexual harassment was arguably positioned as in need of protection from her own femininity um, by the more masculine figure of Hughes. And Hughes did comment as well that um, after she had the entire retirement age enforced upon her and she uh, had to leave the meatworks, that when she went back uh, months and years later in a kind of worsening economic climate um, of the late 1970s when stagflation was starting to take hold, um, that a lot of the chauvinist ideas that she had challenged when she was a worker there had started to come back to the, to the, to the fore. Um, and it, yeah, I guess even if not all workers shared those kind of chauvinist ideas, um, there was growing ambivalence and indifference to the kind of feminist causes that Hughes was still trying to promote. Um, and so I think we can see here then that cultural change of the kind that we're talking about is a very difficult and uh, precarious task. Um, and it often depended not just on individuals forging new modes of gender performance, but also on the continual repetition of those um, transgressive performances. The possibilities for agency and for transformation inherent in the possibility of gender were constrained by the context and manner in which they were performed. Uh, and while Hughes's background in the Communist Party um, made her kind of uniquely able uh, and committed to uh, forging these kind of new modes of leadership and of gender performance, I think uh, there were not necessarily other female meat workers that were willing to uh, follow her militant example um, once she had left. And so um, while we can see pro progress, we can also see um, that many of the ideas about kind of male sexual dominance, which had been deeply ingrained in the industry were also um, able to withstand quite a lot of challenge um, and change. So I guess, um, yeah, just by way of conclusion, I think that this kind of, uh, analysis that we're doing here is really important for understanding some of the ongoing inequalities that exist within the labor market because um, it's not just that, uh, yeah, I guess uh, um, rigid conceptions of um, femininity and masculinity have definitely um, come under attack, but we still in many ways constitute men and women as fundamentally different kinds of workers. Um, and that has a number of kind of consequences for them as much economically um, as socially and culturally. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.
Oh, thank you very much, Freya. Um, could you just, yes, yeah, just take your screen off. Thank you. So we can now have um, time, plenty of time for questions. Um, if we have any questions from, um, I, if people want to ask questions, either um, you're going to have to either speak up or put your hand up somehow so I can recognise. Um, I'm happy to have a go, Di, if oh, I can. Yeah, good on you, Bruce. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, look, two fantastic papers, thanks to both speakers. But uh, my question's to Hannah right at the very beginning. Um, I was really interested in your account of the female prison officers as these... Um, as having a responsibility to reform their charges. And what struck me is that in the women's movement amongst uh, benevolent societies and so on, there was a very clear classification between the deserving and the undeserving and categories were drawn up of, of a certain kind of behavior. I'm wondering if these prison officers use that same kind of categorization system, because obviously a woman like Beatrice Phillips, who was in that account, was clearly seen as someone who was almost beyond redemption. So to get that kind of moral classification system working, oh, and just quickly before I forget, um, sad that so many of those records were lost in a fire. They're sometimes reproduced in colonial secretaries files. Um, so you'll get reports coming to the colonial secretary. So that might be a tip for you later. Thank you. I'll look into that. Uh, there definitely was a sense of hierarchy. It was very much um, sort of first time offenders versus repeat offenders. And that's sort of where they, they drew the difference. Um, so it was first time offenders you've been led a bit off the, you know, the correct path, you've been led a bit astray. So there's a much higher chance that we can catch you before you become a recidivist and keep coming back. Mm. And so there was that kind of sense. And I think that's how it played out in this situation. Um, whether you were completely, you know, no hope, we're never going to reform you because you keep doing this or we've caught you early enough, we can help you out. Okay, thank you. Is, do we have any other questions? If people want to put any questions in the chat, I can also see them there. Hi, Di, I don't know if you can see my hand up. Oh, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. <laughs> I can only see a certain number of... Yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm looping in. I, again, um, thanks both um, for your papers. Um, I had a question um, for, for both of you, actually. For Hannah, I'm wondering about the impulse um, to appoint um, the women to these roles um, and how that related to what was going on at the time about getting women police um, and whether those two things were overlooked, uh, over, overlapping because that occurred in the First World War, I think, so that was sort of a bit after. Um, but also the, um, the movement to get women factory inspectors because of their particular expertise. Um, and my um, other question um, for Freya um, is about the, the demonstration of masculinity and the, the kind of the discourse around women being, you know, frail and having reproductive responsibilities and so on. But also, I mean, the work that I did on the clothing union in, in an earlier period, there was a lot of concern because the women were clearly very, some women were very clearly capable of doing this heavy work. And that was a threat to men's masculinity. So, and the response to that was equal pay. So I was kind of surprised that the, this union wasn't interested in equal pay because that was, had actually been a very effective strategy um, to keep women out. So I'll let you both take those. Um, I feel like my answer might be a bit quicker, so I'll just pop it in. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure about factory workers. Um, that really sort of didn't come into my research but would be really interesting to kind of look at the comparisons there. As for the police and, and female police, that was definitely sort of a, a continuation almost it's of the same sort of campaign. Um, so that was kind of World War I. I think the first female police officer was in the early 30s. Um, and so it was sort of this continuation of trying to bring in that kind of sort of you know, moral force, but also a bit, I think it changed a bit by the time you got, they got to police women as sort of also just sort of a figure that women were comfortable around. And that was maybe a bit more of a new thing that they were starting to think of when they started bringing in campaigns for police women. So there was certainly sort of crossover and same sort of ideas behind both. Mm. 
Thanks. Um, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I think the issue of equal play, it, it actually it comes up quite a lot. I, another, another chapter in my thesis was on um, equal pay. Uh, and the AMIU's relationship with it is quite sort of varied and checkered. And um, it depends a lot kind of where you are geographically, also who you are in the union hierarchy, um, and at what point in time you, you take the issue. Um, uh, Marjorie Gerard has written about the response to equal pay um, by the AMIU in Queensland. Um, and her argument is that there, at least fairly early on, um, the AMIU takes a stance of being for equal pay actually on the basis of gender equality. So in the, as early as the 50s and 60s, they're thinking about gender equality. Um, certainly where I picked up in the 1970s, I found in Victoria, um, the AMIU was involved in the 1969 test case um, and the 1972 test case for equal pay. They were one of the awards selected. And I think in Victoria in 1969, it definitely was motivated by actually trying to get women sort of out of the union or trying to kind of remove the economic incentive for employers um, to hire women. Uh, but one of the kind of defining features of the AMIU is that it was fairly democratic um, and led by the rank and file. And so um, actually, I think over the course of the campaign, basically from 1969 until it was finally instituted in 1974 and 1975, there actually was a sort of women-led shift in the attitudes um, towards a much more, you know, and this of course influenced also by the by the general climate of the women's liberation movement. And it did become much more a campaign um, about gender equality because that was really what the kind of demands of the women that were leading the campaign um, was. And I think Hughes is a good example of that in Queensland. So, you know, in Queensland, you have a lot of tensions as well between what the kind of officials are saying, like they had an official policy perhaps of equal pay on the basis of gender equality, but um, on the shop floor, there was, you know, quite, people had quite independent views, sometimes tension with, or, you know, or they just were not necessarily always going to follow the line of the officials. And so that's where you get some of these kind of residual tensions about, we don't want to strive for equal pay or, or, you know, people still had, I guess, um, chauvinistic um, view, views and ideals. So, yeah, it's definitely a definitely a complicated issues and people had very um, mixed motivations. And I think the skill of the women was to kind of just harness um, whatever energy they could and actually do, try and do the work of persuading people um, kind of as the campaign progressed. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have others that I can't see? Yeah, I have a question. Philip Thank here. You, Philip. You're good. <laughs> a question here for Freya. I'm just wondering whether there was any significant overlap between um, uh, the militant members of the AMIEU and the women's movement. Um, I know that Yvonne um, Smith, for one, who actually just died earlier this year, which you may or may not know, um, was a very active in the UAW and then later embraced second wave feminism. I'm just wondering whether uh, that happened to a significant degree and therefore those militant women in the union were emboldened by their involvement in either the older um, UAW or the, the emerging organisations within the second wave women's movement. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. There, there's a significant amount of crossover. So. Um... Definitely Alice Hughes, who I mentioned, so that's one of the facts I left off, but she was actually a founding member of the UAW in Queensland. Um, so, and definitely that, you know, particularly in Queensland, there was a lot of links to the Communist Party. So um, she definitely had come through kind of that blend of militant and, and women's organising. Um, and I do, yeah, and similarly, yeah, Yvonne Smith was very involved in the UAW. And of course, another kind of famous second wave feminist uh, who worked for a short time at the AMIU was Zelda Deprano, yeah. who um, chained herself to the uh, Arbitration Commission to argue for equal pay. And she'd been a receptionist um, at the Meat Workers Union, um, though she was actually eventually fired um, for her actions 
including um, the chain up and, and other things. Um, and so, but I think, yeah, I think it's difficult. It would be difficult for me to envision some of these women having the impact that they did in the Meat Workers Union without having had that experience mm. in kind of gendered yeah. and women's organising. And I think the, the thing that seems to be really important is having that women's only space as somewhere where they could kind of develop their leadership capabilities and organising mm. skills. And, and I would argue develop these new modes of gender performance where they were sort of, you know, um, dispelling with a lot of the ideas about women as, as submissive or subordinate. Um, and but at the same time, I think there was still, with, uh, particularly you know, in the, still in the 1970s, a deep commitment to also doing the kind of class and the labour-based organising. Um, it wasn't purely a kind of, as some of the later second wave feminist movement became, it wasn't just um, you know a gender issue. It was really um, a very intersectional form of organising at the nexus of kind of class and gender and, and labour and gender. Thanks, Freya. I think there's a really interesting connection between these two papers in that Hannah's looking at the earlier women's movement and its impact on particular kind of work um, in, a, in a different way from the way Freya is looking at it. But it's kind of it's interesting to draw out some of those similarities and, and differences, perhaps, between the these two periods of time. I don't know if you want to say anything more. Hannah um, to follow on from what Freya was saying about the interaction with the women's movement it, which is an important part of what you were saying in your paper yeah yeah it was very much very interconnected um, in the period I'm looking at there was a lot of crossover um, in terms of who was arguing for prison reform and who was arguing for women's suffrage um, and later on once you know women had the vote the various aspects of women's political participation um, and it the, the ideas, I think, as I said, really underpinned, it was very much women's morality and, and that very, um, the characterization that was very central to the women's movement at the time it was also very central to the argument for women working at prisons. Uh, it was very much a, the same thing, you know, women should be here because they exert this moral influence. And I think, yeah, the ideas for both really impacted each other and which is also it's also saying that women should be working women should be yes. doing this work whatever yep. justification you make for it women should be and can be and are able capable of doing this work too you know it's, it's not just a men's job and so and that's very similar <laughs> if you like to the later yep. argument, although it's a very sound looks very different from and the, Evelyn Go she was very much um a proponent for women working um, and for women's increased um, employment opportunities. And so prior to her campaign with the NCWV to get prison mat you know, prison matrons and, and watch house matrons, she was writing pamphlets about women's labor um, and the different labor that women could perform and labor that was gendered and not gendered and the different pay rates and all that sort of stuff. So she was very vocal in that field earlier on and sort of her involvement in the prison matrons campaign kind of came from that background of believing in women's um, right to employment and making sure that there was opportunities out there. Why do you think it hasn't been looked at previously? Why is this an occupation that is so overlooked in the literature? Um, I really don't know. I think there is an element possibly that there is very limited sources out there. So it is a hard one mm -hmm. in terms of just practicalities. Um, I think in terms of people who, you know, when you sort of get an interest in, in penal history, prison history, you do tend to kind of, criminals are more exciting in that sense. You know, there's the whole aspect of dark tourism going on. And, and I think you tend to kind of look at those elements maybe more um, rather than the employees, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure. Yeah, I don't know. So, um... Hi, Guy. Um, just on a lighter note, um, Freya, I, I love your image of the, the union picnic. Yes. Um, it reminded me of um, when I was a child uh, in a coal mining town and we had the, the mine workers' picnics. They didn't just have races for running races for the women. 
they had rolling pin throwing competition. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing that, that I like that's connecting these papers is, yes, your use of images, both of you, in terms of your presentation and how you can read these images for what they convey. In one case, it's a photograph, um, but in the, and a fairly straight photograph, but a, a wonderfully captivating photograph. And in the other, it's this cover of the Union Journal, which is a cartoon in a sense, isn't it? It's a sort of, um, but very revealing. I and mean, you drew it, drew out what it reveals for us very effectively. I thought it's uh, that's my my way of hinting at one of our subsequent. Um, Zoom seminars that we're having later on in the in the semester, which will look at some of the methodology of labour history, including uh, reading visual images. So um, that's great. So um, do we have any other questions? Is there anybody else there with their hand up that I can't see? No, uh, nothing in the chat that I'm overlooking. We have some a lot of thank yous there from people who've had to go, who've really enjoyed the presentation. So can I? Thank both of you um, for, for your wonderful talks. Uh, I think it's great that you're doing um, new research in labor history, picking up threads and themes that are traditional labor history, as you said, but also reworking some of those old questions and, and coming up with um, new occupations and new insights into the field. So uh, that's great. And it's great that labor history is looking so strong and vigorous. <laughs> I hasten to say that's feminist, feminine rather than masculine <laughs> in that sense. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you both very much and good luck with your um, postgraduate studies um, as you proceed. So we hope to hear more from you um, perhaps in the future. And we hope to see more of you at our next seminar, which will be uh, September 19th. So note that in your diaries. I think I've got that date correct, but Carl will send around a notice. So um, thank you, unless anybody has anything further to say. Um, Thanks okay. for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much.